straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. Famed private eye Jack Valentino dies from injuries during an attempted robbery. How police say he helped catch his own killers. For anybody who thinks that they can attack elderly individuals in our city, you need to think twice. A key suspect appears to be flipping in the missing Connecticut mom case, but prosecutors admit evidence in Jennifer Dulos' murder is still largely circumstantial. She basically lies through her teeth. One of R. Kelly's associates pleads guilty to paying off an accuser. What this could mean for the disgraced R&B singer's own trial. A botched murder for hire plot apparently takes out the wrong people. While a Louisiana mother is being credited with pretending to be a rape victim to save her daughter's life. They were asking for the victim and she said, she, she, she Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. A legendary private investigator to the stars killed in San Francisco helped solve his own murder. Law and Crime's Anjanette Levy is here to tell us more about how Jack Palladino collected key evidence in his own death. Yeah, Brian, the two men facing charges in this case, they are Ty Joe and Flournoy and Lawrence Thomas, and they're being held without bail in San Francisco. The DA there says that he's waiting for an official finding from the medical examiner on cause of death before upgrading the charges for both of them to murder. Mr. Palladino was a San Francisco legend, someone who dedicated his career to pursuing justice and truth. San Francisco District Attorney Chesa Bodine vowing justice for Jack Palladino. Palladino was a private eye for President Bill Clinton during the Jennifer Flowers scandal. He worked for Robin Williams and Courtney Love. Palladino also investigated the Jonestown massacre, and Patty Hearst hired him to investigate her kidnapping. He also looked into the background of a prosecution witness in one of R. Kelly's criminal cases. It was a consummate rock and tour and a great character, a dear, dear friend, and I'll mourn his loss the rest of my life. Friends of Palladino say he always had a camera, and last week was no different when he saw something strange outside of his home. Witnesses on the scene reported seeing a suspect in the passenger side of a vehicle in a physical struggle over Mr. Palladino's camera. During the struggle, the vehicle sped away, causing Mr. Palladino to fall to the ground. Palladino suffered a head injury that took his life. He had taken photos of what he had found suspicious. Here, Mr. Palladino, an investigator to the very last day of his life, to the very last act of his life, took photos that helped confirm police work identifying the two assailants in this case. Jack Palladino was actually the second elderly person killed in an attack in San Francisco in the last week. The two men facing charges in his death will be back in court next week. At that time, they would both enter pleas to the charges. Brian? Thanks, Anjanette. Joining me today is New York City Public Defender Anna Carlson and Terry Austin. Terry, the defendants are being charged with attempted uh, robbery. What is the DA waiting for to hear from the ME before filing these murder charges? Well, Brian, the DA wants to see the medical examiner's report because it's going to provide detailed evidence about the cause and the manner of death. So the cause of death would be something like falling and hitting his head, or maybe it could be something like a heart attack, and we will hear about that. But the manner is going to tell us whether or not the ME thinks it was murder, suicide, accident, natural causes, or unknown. And I think that is going to definitely help the DA determine whether or not they can bring a charge of murder against, you know, these individuals. Now, on a safe bet that it's going to be a murder charge coming, but what do you expect that murder charge to look like? Premeditated, reckless or negligent, or maybe felony murder? And why? I would absolutely guess felony murder in this case. I think it's it's sounding like this was maybe a robbery that they were that they they didn't plan to come after him, you know, because of who he was, but rather because of equipment. So if if there is a death in the course of another felony, that would be what we call a felony murder. Unfortunately, for um, the people charged, they could be just as liable for the murder, even if they didn't intend for any injury to occur. Makes sense. Now, Anjanette, there are a lot of questions floating around, particularly about the men being charged in Palladino's death, being suspects in another murder, and asking why, if anything, he was still on the streets, right? 
Yeah, that's right, Brian. Ty Jun Flournoy was actually named a suspect in another murder last year. He was not charged in that case. Two other men were, and the DA said there just simply wasn't enough evidence to charge him and another man who was also seen in the area at the time, but the case remains under investigation. Flournoy, when this attack happened last week, was actually on probation for a misdemeanor gun charge. So his probation on that charge has also been revoked while he deals with this other case as well. Yeah, so he's probably going to be in on probation and also facing these charges. These two are definitely going to have a lot of criminal cases and woes ahead of them. Thank you all for contributing. Two federal agents are dead and three are wounded after serving a warrant in a crimes against children case. The FBI says agents arrived to search an apartment in Sunrise, Florida on Tuesday morning. The suspect, who is not yet named, is believed to have opened fire and then shot and killed himself. The agents reportedly were executing a warrant to gather evidence, including the suspect's computer, for a child pornography case. Agents Laura Swashenberg and Daniel Afflin died from their injuries. The shootout was one of the deadliest days in the FBI's history. Fallen Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick is receiving a distinct tribute laying an honor in the Capitol Rotunda. Sicknick died last month from injuries sustained during the riot at the Capitol building. Following a ceremony by lawmakers, Sicknick's remains will be taken to Arlington National Cemetery. He's the third Capitol Police officer to lay in honor in the rotunda. The pitching coach for the Los Angeles Angels has been suspended after five women allege sexual misconduct. Five women are accusing Mickey Calloway of lewd behavior in an interview with The Athletic. According to the report, the women say Calloway sent them shirtless photos, requested nude pictures, and in one instance, thrusted his crotch in a reporter's face. The alleged behavior spans five years and his employment with three different organizations. Calloway responded to the claim stating any relationship in which I engage has been consensual. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, one of R. Kelly's associates admits to paying off witnesses on the singer's behalf. But first, one of the defendants accused in the disappearance of a mother of five reportedly... It appears one of the friends of a deceased husband, accused in his wife's disappearance, is ready to testify against the husband's mistress. Jennifer Dulos was reported missing in May 2019 after dropping her kids off in Connecticut. Police became suspicious and then arrested her husband, Photos Dulos, along with his girlfriend, Michelle Traconis, and friend, Kent Mohini. Photos Dulos died last January of an apparent suicide. Traconis and Mohini have each pled not guilty to conspiracy to commit murder. Traconis is also facing charges of evidence tampering. Prosecutors say they intend to call Mahini at Traconis' trial. Much of this case is going to be proven by circumstantial evidence. Uh, 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 Ms. Traconis' interviews with the state police, I think, are, are very telling, not in what she directly says, but what she doesn't say. She basically lies through her teeth uh, about where she was, where Mr. Dulos was, uh, what she was doing on certain dates. Um, the statements she gives track along her alibi script almost exactly. So this argument that the scripts themselves are, are just these innocent productions that her attorney uh, asked her to write, they turned out to be lies. She admitted in the interviews that they were lies. She said, yes, this is not true, what we wrote down here and what I said to you. Attorney Cummings, is, is the yes, state sir. intending to call Mr. Mohini as a witness? Uh, as of now, yes, I believe so. Obviously, that could change. The uh, counsel claiming that this is the state's star witness. I, I think counsel has straw manned much of what the state has said uh, in, in this argument and in others. Um, we don't have a star witness. Uh, Attorney Mawinney's statement is one piece out of many pieces pointing to the defendant's guilt in this case that the state mayor um, put on uh, at trial. Prosecutors are seeking to have three cases against Draconis joined together, a motion her defense is objecting to. When Mr. Cummings says my client was lying, I would have to respond by saying, but you read, you watch those videos, and if the court has seen them, the, have not. Detectives, the detectives lie through their teeth to my client and then tell her we know that there were, and this is why I brought it up, those were body parts in those garbage bags. They say that to her. She starts crying hysterically. So they lied a million times, and then 
said, oh, she changed her story because they said it would be not possible not to know what was in those bags. So I don't want to get into a credibility fight with Mr. Cummings or Mr. Colangelo, or for that matter, the police detectives in this case. There's a missing person. They want to solve that. I get that. However, I submit that when the court decides on consolidating cases, particularly when they belong in another jurisdiction, the state has a burden not to say, well, we got all this stuff, but to specifically say, here is what we intend to offer, which is cross-admissible. I don't have to guess on that, nor does the court have to guess about that. Back to break down the latest chapter of the tragic Dulo saga is public defender Honor Carlson and co-host Terry Austin. Terry, Mahaney is claiming Draconis and Dulos tried to, I guess, solicit him into a conspiracy to do away with Jennifer Dulos. Does that ring true to you or sound like a ploy for leniency? It definitely sounds like a ploy. You have to wonder why this was not his position when it first occurred back in January 2020 when he was arrested. You know, his original story was that he didn't remember what happened on the day Jennifer disappeared. He was actually at the house for a meeting on that fateful day, and he claimed that he fell and he didn't remember what happened. Now, all of a sudden, he's, you know, saying that he was being solicited to do away with Jennifer and he had nothing to do with it. There's a real question of credibility here, Brian, and I think that Draconis' attorney is going to try to say that Mohini's story is made up because he is actually trying to get a favorable treatment from, you know, cooperating with uh, investigators. Definitely a possible argument. Anna, it got a little heated during the, uh, the hearing. Discovery was a big point. The defense wanted the evidence, quote unquote, explained. And the prosecutor said they don't have to, again, hold hands through the evidence. So who's right here? Well, I think it's a split down the middle and it's going to be entirely up to the judge. I think um, one place where it's likely they will get a little bit more of a roadmap is something that I see all the time with phone calls. Often in my cases, I'll have hundreds of hours of phone calls and this is a case, a uh, conspiracy case. So I would expect they may have even some calls from the 10 months that Mawinney was in jail that they're trying to introduce. I would guess that they'll be able to get a little bit of a roadmap if they're sorting through hundreds of hours of calls to try to cut down which of these calls are we saying could be specific. Um, but other than that, you know, the evidence in these cases, I think the defense should assume that he should review everything very carefully. Exactly. Thank you both. Coming up on Law and Crime Daily, federal prosecutors charge university officials with hiding their work with China. Plus, singer R. Kelly's legal battles continue to build as one of his co-defendants pleads guilty in court. These cases and more, next. ...with underage girls and intimidated potential witnesses. Investigators reportedly wiretapped his associates and overheard Richard Arlen Jr. offering the accuser hundreds of thousands of dollars to not cooperate with authorities. According to court documents, Arlen said the singer was going to pay her to be quiet because she had too much information. R. Kelly's defense attorney, Steve Greenberg, told the Law and Crime Network that his client is not guilty. Uh, obviously, the law of averages is going to catch up with us at some point. But, you know, it, it's, it's this sort of buyer's remorse. In many of these cases, with many of these allegations, these were people that were ecstatic to be with R. Kelly. They were happy to be with R. Kelly. And now someone else has said to them, oh, no, it was no good. Times have changed. And, and in hindsight, they're sort of repurposing the encounters. Here to break down the R&B, the rape and bribery of R. Kelly's case, are attorneys Terry Austin and Anna Carlson. <laughs> Terry, trying to bribe a witness is a serious crime. What penalties could Richard uh, Arlen face? You know, it's a very serious crime, and under New York law, he faces up to 15 years in prison, and he's pled guilty. Remember, he was arrested in Illinois, but he pled guilty actually by Zoom, and that was in connection to charges in the New York case involving, obviously, R. Kelly. You know, the attorney has said here that the prosecution is really going to push, because this was really a shock to the conscience, and I totally agree with that. When you have anybody who's trying to bribe a witness, it undermines the criminal justice system, and I think they should, and I think they will pursue this to the fullest extent of the law.
Now, Anna, when it comes to the witness tampering, could a jury in the rape case also hear that he tried to silence the witness, or will that be a completely and separate case? Well, I think if there's anything to tie him to, to this individual who just, uh, who just took a plea, I think if there's anything to tie R. Kelly back to that person making the bribes, then absolutely, under a theory of consciousness of guilt. So it's not the case that your crime stops when when you're when the actual act that you're charged with stops. A jury is allowed to look at how you reacted after the fact and determine are you acting like a guilty person? Are you acting like you have consciousness of guilt? And that can include did you flee a scene? Did you have a false alibi? Did you hide or destroy evidence? In fact, I always counsel my clients, you know, if you know the police are looking for you, turn yourself in, um, hire an attorney don't get in a car chase because you don't want to create anything that looks like consciousness of guilt. I think attempting to bribe a witness uh, is clearly consciousness of guilt. Yeah, I think a strong chance is coming into the new case. I, I would agree with you there, Anna. When we come back, a rape suspect allegedly hires hitmen to take out his accusers, but they apparently kill the wrong people. The three suspects now behind bars after the break. Professors at top American universities are facing criminal charges accused of work for foreign governments. Chief investigative correspondent Brian Ross digs into how millions of dollars could have gone unreported. Thanks, Brian. Coming up this week on Brian Ross Investigates, the China Initiative, a look at the highly controversial effort begun by the Trump administration to crack down on supposed Chinese espionage in this country with a focus on American scientists and professors. At least 10 American professors from some of the best universities in the country have been arrested and charged with taking secret payments from China. It has become much too commonplace that the ruling Communist Party of China thinks it can conduct illegal activity and bend people here in the United States to its will in order to try and surpass our country as the world's leading superpower. This is the Justice Department's effort to really try to root out uh, contacts that have been in place or uh, something in, co in combination with the FBI to really kind of get their arms around to the extent to which China is collecting in the U.S. either for espionage purposes or just state collection. But now there's a pushback from the academics of this world. We'll talk about it this week on Brian Ross Investigates. Brian? Thanks, Brian. We'll be sure to check that out when we can. In other news, Louisiana police say three men are facing charges after a murder-for-hire plot ended with the deaths of two unintended targets. Bo Colmier was arrested last May for third-degree rape of his niece. Investigators believe Colmier hired two hitmen, his friends, Andrew Escon and Dalvin Wilson, to kill the rape accuser so she couldn't testify against him. But when the men allegedly went to the victim's house on January 16th, her mother and Colmier's sister, Brittany Colmier, said she was her and was shot. Neighbor Hope Nelton tried to fight off the suspects and was shot as well. Here's how police say they carried out the plot. Both Andrew and Dalvin traveled to Montague to conduct surveillance on a resident sometime after July, but before November. On November 2020, Andrew and Dalvin returned to Montague to commit the homicide using a family member's vehicle, but it was a failed attempt. On January 13th, Dalvin used Andrew's truck to commit the murder. Shooter asking for the rape victim by name, and Brittany Cormier tells the shooter she's the rape victim, accepting her fate to save the life of an actual victim. Hope Nettleson actually struggled with the shooter and was shot fighting him off. Andrew S. Khan and Dalvin Wilson both confessed their involvement in this incident. All right, Anna and Terry are here one last time to break down this murder for hire plot. Anna, I want you to imagine you're picked up Cormier's case at arraignments. What are the two worst facts you'll have to face at trial as his lawyer? Well, this, this uh, press conference just took place yesterday, so there really aren't a lot of facts out there. But one thing I do know is that there were living witnesses to the incident. There, were, there are um, at least voice, and I think you know, facial witnesses to the killing of these two women. I've read that there were there were three witnesses. And unfortunately, I think your two worst facts are that two of those witnesses were children. 
Um, they were children who were hidden in a closet but heard what happened. Depending on the age of those children, they may not be qualified to testify in a court, but uh, boy, that's a bad fact that you have children hiding who, who heard what happened. You know, that's, that's going to be really pulling on the heartstrings of any jury that might see this case. Um, and, just, and just the fact that you have, you know, someone who can identify these people. Absolutely. And Terry, do you think the murder for hire of a rape victim will have an impact on the willingness of other rape victims to testify? Absolutely. It's really going to have a very chilling effect, Brian, on anyone who's a rape victim. First of all, you have to come up and testify, and it's a very difficult, sensitive subject to discuss. But the fact that you know that there was a plot against this individual to be killed is going to definitely prevent you from wanting to come and testify. And frankly, it's an assault on the criminal justice system. And the DA said that he might just even consider the death penalty. So he considers it seriously as well. Absolutely. The death penalty being on the table shows a prosecutor who might be pushing all the way. Anna, Terry, thank you for joining us. And thank you for joining us here at Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.